Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 16th session of Asia Graphics webinar. And I am Xie Jin Chen from University of Science and Technology of China. Uh, it, it's my honor to chair today's session. And we are glad that we have two excellent speakers today. And uh, we have uh, two talks. The first talk is controllable generative models, the quest of photorealistic reloaded. And our first speak is Professor uh, Danny Lichsky. And I will give a short introduction of uh, Professor Danny Lichsky. Uh, <coughs> well, uh, uh, Danny Nitschke is a professor at the School of Computer Science and Engineering at the Hebrew University of uh, uh, Jerusalem, Israel. He received his PhD from Cornell University in 1994 and was a postdoc at the University of Washington until 1996. In 2002 and seven, uh, three. He spent a sabbatical year at Pixar Animation Studios. In 2012, he received the Eurographics Outstanding Technical Contributions Award. In 2017, he served as the technical paper chair of SIGGRAPH Asia in 2007. Uh, his research of interest span a wide variety of topics in the fields of computer graphics, image and video processing, and computer vision. Most of his recent work involves deep neural networks and their applications in graphics and vision. OK, uh, let's welcome uh, Professor Danny Lichtsky to give uh, the first talk. Uh, thank you very much, Shojin, for the introduction. Uh, let me just share the screen for a second and start my presentation. Oh, just a reminder for our audience, if you have any question and you can uh, send your message through our uh, live uh, broadcast. Great, so everybody can see my, my slides? Yes. Great. Okay. So uh, let's get started. So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to give a talk uh, in this uh, Asia Graphics webinar. Um, so today I'm going to talk about controllable generative models. Uh, basically, over the last 10 years, uh, my research agenda, as well as that of most of my colleagues, has changed drastically. And this extreme change results, of course, from the fact that deep neural networks have emerged and have been extremely successful in various tasks of computer vision and, and graphics and other fields as well. Um, and of particular importance to people like me, uh, who basically grew up doing computer graphics, uh, you know, starting from my master's thesis work and uh, until now, um, it's the... Uh, the fact that uh, today's generative neural networks, they provide like a whole world of opportunities compared to what was available to us just a few years ago. So in my talk today, I would like to first start with a very brief personal perspective and then share with you uh, uh, some details about uh, a couple of my recent projects, uh, you know, all of which involve controlling uh, generative models in order to um, synthesize and manipulate uh, images. So I've been doing computer graphics for a very long time, like I said, actually since 1988. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty old. Uh, and I became fascinated with computer graphics after learning about ray tracing in, in a computer graphics course that I took. And then I ended up doing my thesis, my master's thesis on, on ray tracing. And this, this pink teapot that you see here is actually one of the images from my master's thesis. It's one of the first images I produced ever. And uh, then I was so excited about photorealistic image synthesis that I went to uh, pursue a PhD degree at Cornell University, which was the uh, uh, you know best place, place at the time for 
for for photorealism and global illumination and there i work on radiosity and here's an image from my phd thesis over there um and um in fact uh my advisor at cornell don greenberg he was a big fan of photorealism and he we used to joke that he would like to start every paper with the words photorealistic image synthesis is the holy grail of computer graphics and in fact i remember him adding the sentence to the beginning of one of my papers but but i removed it because i thought it was uh, you know a little bit too commonly used uh and back then uh which was 30 years ago we really didn't have any idea about neural networks and we didn't even use optimization that much at the time but already back then, we were really aware of the fact that ordinary image metrics, like just comparing pixel values, were not able to capture high level concepts such as realism. And we were really talking amongst ourselves and fantasizing about developing some kind of a perceptual error metric or a photorealism oracle that would help us determine how realistic an image is and how it its realism can can be improved and this this is not a very simple task for example if i show you these two images i mean i cannot see you so i'm not going to do a show of hands but uh would you be able to easily tell which of those two images is real and which of those images is fake I'll, let's just take five seconds to think about it and form your own opinion and in fact both of these images are synthetic and they're fake um so uh this just goes to show you that telling whether an image is, is real or not is not an easy task but in machine learning uh something has emerged that that tries to address this task which is the uh, uh the concept of discriminator in in generative adversarial networks or, or GANs so for those of you who are maybe not familiar with GANs I will do uh, a really short uh review uh, so, uh, in 2014, there was a very famous paper published by, by Ian Goodfellow and uh, several co-authors from the University of Montreal, uh, which was called Generative Adversarial Nets, and they introduced a new kind of, of a generative model uh, that was able to generate all sorts of uh, um, uh, data from different distributions, among them uh, images that look like like real images so uh you know since i was waiting for uh um uh, for, for something like this for for many many years i was very excited and i was not the only one basically you can see uh here on the uh on the on the slide that uh you know several famous people in in the uh in the community have said that this is like one of the most influential ideas in 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 machine learning in the last decade and the number of papers that deal with with GANs and for example just have GAN in their title or abstract was growing very fast and this 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 plot only shows the growth of of the number of publications only until 2019 it has continued since I mean nowadays there are other things people are very excited about, like transformers and diffusion models. We'll talk about some of them a bit later, but GANs are still very much uh, uh, play an important role in, in, in generative models. So uh, the idea behind uh, GANs or generative adversarial networks is to train a generative model by actually training two competing players. Uh, this is a concept that's called adversarial training where one player is uh, the so-called generator which you can think of as a person who's trying to forge or make produce fake works of art uh, but unlike uh, uh, an art forger in real life the generator in a GAN does not really know what a real image looks like uh, so in that sense he is working uh, uh, blindfolded and only receives uh, some kind of a random uh, uh, vector as input. And the second player, uh, which is part of the GAN, is the discriminator, which you can think of as a detective or uh, uh, an art expert. And 
whose expertise is to to look at images and to tell whether the image is a genuine original uh, artwork or uh, a fake work made by the uh, forger. And uh, the idea is to train these two networks or two models together, and both of them then are gradually improving until hopefully they reach some kind of an equilibrium, the Nash equilibrium. And at this point, the distribution of samples uh, or images produced by the generator is really indistinguishable from, from the distribution of images in the, in the training data. Um, and then the discriminator, the best thing he can do is just to guess, uh, just flip a coin uh, to guess whether a given sample is, is real or fake. Uh, and in practice, both the generator and the discriminator are implemented as differential neural networks and the training process just alternates between them uh, while attempting to minimize some loss functions, which are written on the slides. I'm not going to go into the loss functions. That's a little bit outside of the scope. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the discriminator, remember, is just a classifier uh, whose goal is to classify samples as real or fake. And um, uh, th that's when he learns to classify them correctly, his loss decreases and the, the generator attempts to increase the uh, loss of the uh, uh, discriminator by producing um, uh, samples which are indistinguishable from real ones. So that was uh, generative adversarial networks just in a nutshell. Um, and one of the major applications of GANs is synthesis of realistic images. And here we can see on this slide, we can see a demonstration of the progress of GANs since they were introduced in 2014 and uh, until a few years ago, uh, where I think they've reached pretty much the, the current level that they're at. Uh, this shows it on, on human faces, but GANs can generate other images, not only human faces, but basically, you can see that the degree of realism has been, and the resolution of the images that they can generate has been quickly uh, increasing and improving. And in particular, this image on the on the right uh, is generated by a particular gun architecture, which is called Style Gun. It was developed at Nvidia uh, in uh, 2018, and um, uh, I'm I'm going to talk about this architecture quite a bit. Uh, uh, in the next couple of projects that I'm going to uh, be telling you about. So uh, I just want to, to, to demonstrate to you that, that guns and style gun in particular are not only good for generating human faces. So here you can see some examples of images of churches, uh, images of bedrooms, and images of cars. They were all generated by different uh, uh, um, style gun models. So you, you need to understand that in order to generate a, an image from a certain class, you need to train uh, a, a GAN model that specializes on that class, okay? You, you, normally it's difficult to train a single GAN model that would generate just about uh, uh, any uh, general natural images. Usually the images come from some restricted domain, but, uh, uh, we'll have to live with that restriction for a while. Okay. So, um, in order to explain to you uh, something about the research that we've done on StyleGun, I need to explain first the uh, a little bit more about its architecture. Okay. So, um, let's let's dive into the architecture of the StyleGun generator. Um, so here on the left, what you see is the classical generator architecture, which is just a convolutional neural network with uh, uh, several stages uh, where each stage increases the resolution further. And then you, you start with, with some image formed from a random vector and you, uh, by repeatedly applying convolutions to it and increasing the resolution, you generate an image. Uh, now, the uh, style gun architecture generator of the generator is a bit different in the sense that uh, before it starts operating on the uh, on the random uh, vector, which we call the latent code, 
it first maps it into uh, another space. So if the original latent codes, they're just some uniformly distributed or, or normally distributed random vectors, um, we have another latent space, which is called the intermediate latent space. And usually it's denoted by W. And there is a mapping function that maps the uh, uh, latent vectors from the simple space to this intermediate latent space. And um, then vectors from this intermediate latent space are further mapped using affine transformations into uh, a set of uh, um, uh, style vectors, one style vector for each convolution layer. And these style vectors, uh, their role is to modify the statistics of the activations in inside each layer. And these different statistics are actually responsible for all the different images that the generator is able to generate. So uh, what's extremely cool about StyleGAN is that this uh, intermediate latent space, W, uh, actually uh, has a lot of uh, rich semantic structure. And uh, what's, 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 what's important about that is that the fact that we can make use, take advantage of the semantic structure in order to uh, achieve different changes to images simply, simply by taking steps in the latent space. So for example, if we start from the original image, which you see in the column on, on the left, by taking steps in the latent space, uh, we can generate images that look like they're uh, older or have uh, all of a sudden have glasses or or look more masculine or change the pose and other types of changes like uh, the illumination can appear differently and uh, um, oh, some of them repeat pose expression, etc. Uh, so basically, uh, in, in, in the, the principle, just a second, oh, yeah. The principle is that each image generated by the style gun is associated with some latent vector, let's call it W. And by taking some kind of a step uh, delta in the latent space, we can get an image that is similar to the original image, but differs from it in some high level semantic attribute. Okay. So people, there, there, there have been a lot of work uh, basically that was were exploring and utilizing the the semantics of the w latent space in order to achieve different types of uh, uh, edits and manipulations that you can do on images now in that context it's very important to mention this concept which is called uh disentanglement so what do i mean by disentanglement suppose we want to change uh, the gray hair of a, uh, the, 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 the color of the hair of the person to, to become uh, uh, gray instead of black, okay? But uh, so the question is when I do that, whether other attributes are changing as well. So for example, you can see here uh, results produced by a, a couple of existing methods. And you see that while the, uh, they managed to make the black hair uh, to turn it into gray, they've also made the entire face look older, which may or may not be what we wanted. And another example is where we wanted to uh, add some red lipstick to the face. And again, we can do that by, by taking a step in latent space, but uh, in one of the existing methods, taking such a step also uh, made the entire face uh, appear brighter. And another existing method uh, actually completely changed the identity of the person in the image. So those manipulations are what we would call entangled in the sense that one change induces other changes. The changes are interrelated, they're entangled, they're not independent, okay? In contrast, what we would like to have for, uh, for better user control over the result is disentangled manipulation, like the results that you have here, where only the change that you wanted to happen has occurred and nothing else has changed. Only the hair changed from black to gray, only the lipstick uh, changed from natural to red and nothing else uh, in the face seems to have changed, okay? So 
this is the uh, 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 this was the topic of of the first project that I want to tell you about. Uh, this is a project with uh, my PhD student who's since uh, graduated. Actually, he's from China. His name is Wu Zhongde, and um, uh, also with uh, Eli Schechtman from uh, Adobe. And uh, that was presented in CVPR 2021. So basically, um, in a nutshell, what we tried to do in this project is to answer two questions. So the first question was, uh, what's the uh, latent space that's best to use for such types of uh, disentangled uh, semantic edits? And uh, the second question is, uh, once you decide which space to use, how do you find the direction in the space where you want to go, basically. <clears throat> so uh, let's go back to the architecture uh, of the style gun, and we can see that we we actually have here uh, sort of uh, three or four different latent spaces. We have the original simple space Z. We have the intermediate space W, which sometimes people uh, extended by creating multiple copies of it, and they call it W plus. And also there's the space of these uh, style parameters, which are uh, the little boxes, the little blue boxes marked S1 through SN. So uh, we found that in the literature, there are some measures that people have developed or metrics that people have developed for uh, uh, measuring the amount of disentanglement of a representation. And uh, what we found is that despite the fact that most existing works use either the Z space or the WW plus spaces to perform the edits, in fact, uh, according to the standard metrics, the uh, S space, which is the space of the uh, uh, parameters that modify the statistics of the, of the convolution layers, is the one that has the uh, uh, best disentanglement characteristics. So we decided that we want to explore that space and to find uh, controls within that space to, to develop a methodology for finding the controls in that space that would allow us to, to create disentangled edits in, in images, okay? So uh, one part of that methodology uses uh, 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 the fact that we can uh, create a semantic segmentation of an image. Like for example, if we have a face, we can create a semantic, semantic mask that uh, tells us where the hair, the nose, et cetera, are. And then we can examine the uh, gradients of different uh, style space uh, components uh, to see which of those components has a gradient with the greatest overlap with each uh, semantic um, uh, region. So for example, we can find, for example, here we can find that um, um, th that the uh, uh, gradient of the uh, uh, parameter channel number 286 in level number 11 has a gradient which is very high at the areas of which correspond to hair, right? And so indeed, when we try to isolate the effect of this parameter, we see that indeed in this image or in many other images, in fact, it, uh, it, it changes the, uh, the color of the hair from, from brown to, to gray and doesn't really do much else. Similarly, we were able to find that another parameter, um, uh, Maybe you should, you should, you should. I hope you can see here that the eyes of that person are, are are changing their gaze. Okay, and indeed this parameter, which is parameter four hundred and nine in level number nine, it has a, a, a high gradient in the area of the eyes. And similarly, we were able to find uh, parameters that control different motions of the mouth and uh, different things that relate to other aspects of the human face, such as uh, such as eyebrows. For example, uh, here's a, a bunch of uh, other parameters that we found. Uh, they're all shown using the same face. Uh, so we, you, you can see we, we have a whole set of parameters that uh, control different aspects of the hair and some uh, a few, quite a few parameters control 
different motions of the mouth or uh, things which are related to the eyes and the eyebrows, okay? And, and each of them is just uh, typically modifying just one attribute, one visual attribute, while uh, everything else remains the same, you know, when, when we open and close the mouse, for example, the hair doesn't change and so forth. So those are disentangled uh, manipulations. And again, to convince you that this is uh, not only helpful for faces, we also performed the same type of analysis on, uh, on a Stalgan model that was uh, trained on, on the set of uh, bedrooms, Elsan bedrooms. And you can see we were able to find parameters that uh, control the uh, length of the bed spread and uh, whether or not there are pillows on the bed and whether or not there's a, a, a lamp next to the bed, for example, while everything else is, is not changing. So that was one method with which we found how to discover semantically meaningful parameters in the uh, space of the style parameters of, of, uh, of style gun. Um, so some, some attributes that we would also like to be able to control, they're not limited to a specific semantic area. Uh, or maybe they are, but we don't have semantic segmentations for them, for example. So let's suppose we want to uh, uh, find a control of the style gun, which determines whether or not a person is going to be wearing a hat in the generated image. So we can, we can pick just a few examples of images with hats, like for example, of images of people with hats, for example, 20 or 30 such images. And we can compare uh, their average, uh, basically style vectors uh, to the average style vector over a large larger population of images, uh, some of which may or may not have hats. You know, most of them were not gonna have this, uh, hat because it's just one feature out of many. And then this way we can identify by, by performing this kind of uh, like a signal to noise type of computation, uh, which channel stands out in the, in the example, in the exemplar images uh, compared to the population of, of random images. And in this manner, we could also determine a large number of different attributes. Let me show you uh, some examples. So for example, indeed, we were able to find a channel that controls whether or not a person is wearing something on their head, uh, whether or not uh, a person, male or female, it doesn't matter, has a goatee beard, and uh, also change the uh, gender, the apparent gender of the person from appearing more feminine to appearing more masculine, uh, you know, without anything else changing. So. As you can see, operating in style space and uh, seeking meaningful parameters in this way is, is a very powerful image editing tool. But uh, everything I've showed you so far was done on synthetic images, that images that were generated uh, by, by the gun. They're not real images. In typically, what we would like to do is we would like to take a real image and to manipulate it. So. For example, suppose somebody gives this uh, image of uh, uh, Will, Will Smith, he's a Hollywood actor, and we would like to uh, edit this image. So first, so this is a real image. It was not a, it's not an image that's generated by, by a GAN. So the first thing we need to do is to invert the image in the sense that we, we, we need to find a vector or a point in the latent space that generates an image that's maybe not identical, but very close to the image that we want to edit. And this is what an inversion might look like, is the image on the right. Okay. Now, once, once we have the latent code for this image, uh, we can manipulate different style parameters and we can make that image uh, smile. We can add lipstick, we can change the gaze. We can do all these manipulations that we've discovered how to do on synthetic images, on real images as well. Uh, here's another example. Uh, this is the actress, Emilia Clark, and this is what her inverted, uh, gun inverted image looks like. Again, you can see it's not one-to-one -one identical, but it's pretty close. 
and uh, again we can we can perform all these edits that we've discovered how to do on generated images on on real images as well so that was uh, a fun project that we've completed uh, you know but then the next thought was well uh, it's a little bit tedious to look for uh, through lots of controls and, and try to figure out what each control is doing it would be much easier if we could just say what we want uh, the edit to to do and have that happen so for example we could take uh, if we could just take this image of uh, the actor Leonardo DiCaprio and uh, just uh, say blonde hair and then see this change happen, right? Or uh, type angry and change the expression accordingly. Um, or change the hairstyle, for example. <clears throat> So that 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 was the the idea of the next project that that I want to tell you about, which was in addition to uh, Tongzhe and uh, Eli Schechtman, it was a joint project with uh, Or Patashnik and Daniel Cohenor from Tel Aviv University. And here, uh, the idea for this project emerged shortly after uh, OpenAI released their Clip model. Clip is a model that uh, analyzes images and texts and embeds them together in joint space. I will tell uh, ab about how it works uh, in, in, in a couple of slides. Uh, th so the idea was to combine the power of clip and the generative power of StyleGun together. So we, we created a system that was called uh, StyleClip. So in order to tell you how StyleClip works, let's just briefly review what clip does. So basically clip has uh, two embedder, two encoders inside it, which are trained uh, using contrastive losses. And one encoder text takes uh, a sentence in natural language, and another encoder takes uh, an image. And basically, they're trying to find embeddings for the text and for the image, such that uh, the embeddings are similar uh, to each other uh, using uh, cosine dis distance. I mean, let's not go into, into the details of that, but... Uh, Basically, that the embeddings are similar in in this latent space of 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 this clip uh, model. <clears throat> so uh, we use this idea to come up. Uh, I mean, the idea of combining clip with uh, Stalgan and came up with three approaches. Uh, due to uh, uh, lack of time, I will just tell you about one of them. Uh, that's the one that uses the same idea of utilizing controls in, in style space. So basically, uh, given, uh, given uh, a, a text specifying some edit that we'd like to do, so suppose we would like to edit an image so that uh, straight hair becomes curly hair. Uh, so for example, we can generate two sentences one of them would be a woman with straight hair another a woman with curly hair and we could use the clip text encoding to embed both of them into the clip embedding space and that would give us uh, a direction in that space right so now we can try uh, modifying uh, lots of different channels in the style space generate uh, uh, an image corresponding to a change in each channel, actually a pair of images before and after the change, and feed those two images through the clip image encoder, and we will get another direction in, in the clip embedding space. And this is for the manipulation of a single channel. So now we can take the dot product between these two vectors, and we can see how similar or how different they are. And if they're more similar than some threshold, we know that this channel is relevant to, to this edit that we would like to, to make. And um, basically that would allow us to, uh, uh, to select this channel and to perform the desired edit by, by, by manipulating it. And we can select more than one channel. How many channels we select exactly is something that's called uh, the uh, disentanglement parameter. And as the, uh, Disentanglement parameter increases. You can see the effects 
from uh, the top row to the bottom row, the, the changes become uh, basically more drastic. Uh, more things are changing, right? What in, what in this example, what we'd like to do is we would like to change the hair of Elon Musk to, uh, from brown to, to gray, but if we allow the disentanglement parameter to take into account many different channels, then at the same time, it makes Elon Musk older or younger, uh, as you can see in the, in the third row. Okay, so we've built basically after analyzing the channels, which only takes a f like a couple of seconds, uh, you basically can manipulate um, the image interactively. And here's a video that, that shows some of those manipulations. So for example, um, here, is it running? Yeah. Uh, so for example, when we type face with curly hair, curly hair the, the hair changed to, to curly. Uh, we type another style of hair, the, the style changes and we can control the magnitude of the change interactively uh, by the slider that we have. Uh, we can change the hair to, to be long or, uh, or straight. And every time we enter a sentence like that, we analyze which channels are, are suitable for implementing this change. And, and then this change can be applied uh, interactively. And maybe I'll skip to the next one. Yeah, so here's another example, I think, uh, which is nice. So uh, this is the inverted image of uh, uh, Boris Johnson when, when he was still a prime minister of the UK. And we can add some wrinkles to, to this face or remove the wrinkles, making, making his face appear younger. Um, uh, change the expression to said expression. And as you know, the opposite of said is happy. So if we move the manipulation the other way, we, we get the effect of, of, of smiling, uh, change the gender to become more feminine uh, and or more masculine. And we can control how many parameters, how many different attributes are changing by controlling these disentanglement parameters. So if we decrease it, uh, more things are changing, like uh, uh, the shape of the face and the hairstyle can change more drastically. So skip to the next example. Uh, just to show again, not, not only on people, if we want to convert a car into a classic car, for example, this is what Clip knows about classic cars. Uh, in, in knows that the uh, uh, they have the specific shape or a sports car has this specific shape. And the uh, <laughs> clip thinks that the opposite of a sports car is a, is a minivan. And we can even make a cat cute by... Uh, <laughs> automatically, as you can see, using the style gun. Okay, here are a few, a few more examples, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip them in the interest of time uh, because they basically repeat the same. So obviously, as a, as, a, as a good researcher, you always have to try your own medicine on yourself. So when I try my own image and I gave it a text of uh, uh, a beautiful woman with gorgeous hair, uh, this is what I got. Uh, so uh, I don't know, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, so you'll be the judge of that, but it's certainly uh, an interesting effect. Um, so uh, does this mean that we now can do whatever we want in terms of editing images? Uh, not quite, because uh, I've mentioned that GANs are very powerful, but they are domain specific, they, a special model, needs to be trained to generate uh, each domain. 
And uh, when you want to operate on real images, you need to invert them first. And when you invert an image, as I've said, you don't get an exact image, only an approximation of it. For example, here you can see that if the image has some kind of a unique hairstyle, when you invert it into the gun space, that hairstyle uh, can be lost. And uh, uh, the editing effects usually apply to the entire image. It's difficult to, to specify uh, I want only this part of the image to change, not that part. So uh, we had another project, which I, I think in terms of time, I'm not having enough time to tell you about, but I will just mention it briefly, um, which uses, uh, you know, guns were very popular, but nowadays, uh, basically most images are, are, are generated using uh, diffusion models. And we've developed um, a method that allows a user to specify a mask on an image, like you see here in red, and to specify some kind of a text for the content that the user wants to have inside that area. And then uh, the system generates the, the, the requested content. And like I said, we, we, we have been using diffusion models for that. So uh, because of shortage of time, I'm gonna skip the explanation of how diffusion models work. Um, again, we're using clip, uh, but I'm, I will have to skip all of that. I will just show you the results. So uh, the methods we've developed, uh, that, that was with another student of mine. His name is Omri Abrahami, and uh, it was work presented in the, the last uh, CVPR. Basically, the method we've developed allows you to uh, remove images, like you see here, if we have this uh, image of two dogs, we can draw a mask of, over one of them. And we, if we provide no prompt at all, it just, this area just gets impainted, or we can provide some kind of a text over there and then have an object that uh, uh, kind of, according to clip, uh, uh, is compatible with that text, like a bowl, uh, a ball, a ball of water, and so forth. Um, yeah, and this can be used to other purposes. For example, uh, changing the background uh, of uh, a given image to to be something else. For example, if we take an, a picture of a student sitting uh, on the grass on our campus, but you know we can remove the trees in the background and make it as if the person is looking at a mountain or at something that looks like a Chinese. Uh, it's not really the Great Wall, but uh, I mean, that's what uh, Clip thinks is close enough to, to, to being something like it. Okay, so uh, yeah. Uh, so again, in terms of uh, what's left to be done, uh, diffusion is very powerful, but uh, the inference times, the time it takes to generate a single image uh, can be a little bit slow. And typically, uh, furthermore, even though each image takes some time to generate, we need typically to generate multiple results because it's a stochastic process. It's a one-to-many process. Uh, we need to generate multiple results in order to be able to pick uh, a single result, which is a good one. And also... Uh, language models like clip uh, they have their own issues for example you know the clip model is susceptible to so-called typographic attacks attacks in the sense that uh, if it sees a text inside some image <clears throat> instead of an object it can think it's fine so if we ask for a, a rubber toy in this image instead of the brown dog it might generate uh just the, the the text that looks like rubber and clip would think this is fine. Okay, so uh, I think with this, I will uh, I would like to end my talk because uh, I think we're out of time. So I will just uh, thank you for your attention and all the all the codes for the projects I've mentioned are available on GitHub. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Danny, for the nice talk. And
uh, wait, uh, I'm not sure. I didn't receive any questions from the audience now. And I want to ask you one question about the face generation. Uh, actually, we also, in my group, we also did some work on sketch-based images synthesis. And uh, 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 one interesting uh, application or task is to add some, uh, 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 decoration items like eyeglass uh, glasses or earrings, something like that. And uh, uh, well, oh, I'm not sure if the problem uh, of the GAN or the problem of the training data, when we edit these types of uh, eye uh, glasses or earrings, it seems that the model cannot uh, model these types of things. Uh, like when you invert the uh, a real image into the latent space, uh, it seems that the earrings or specific hairstyle is lost. Do you think it's the problem of limited training data or just the, 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 the capacity of the game model? Because it, it seems that it only can model some synthesized right textures into some specific region, but it doesn't yes, know. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think GANs are, are, are so good actually at generating a very varied collection of images because all this data is aligned and, uh, 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 you know, most people don't have these unique hairstyles or, or unique earrings. And so it learns uh, to, 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 to generate that and it's not uh, usually capable to generate very unique features. And like I like I showed in this image, indeed, if you have a specific style of hair, or uh, he's also wearing some earrings. So uh, and 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 as you can see in the in the um, in the inversion, they're gone. Uh, indeed, this is this is this is a problem. I think with the gun uh, because it 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 tends to learn how to generate the more common modes in the distribution and it it tends to ignore the uh, uh less common modes uh and you know there are many different types of earrings and maybe each type appears only once at best in the data set so in that case it's difficult for 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 a gun to to learn it so uh you know what i but however there are ways to achieve better inversion, uh, which requires some fine tuning. So, for example, in the uh, uh, group of the Tel Aviv University from Dani Cohenor, uh, there were several pa papers that that uh, pr proposed different kind of inversion mechanisms. And, for example, one such inversion mechanism is called the uh, pivotal tuning, the PTI. Basically, you start with a regular inversion and then you fine tune. Uh, the weights of the generator itself, the weights of the GAN, not, not just the uh, coordinates of the latent space representation, in order to uh, better capture the uh, specific features of that particular image. Now, of course, you know, it's, it's uh, so, so it, it's, it's <clears throat> possible to capture such things to some extent, but you have to uh, spend more computation time on that. Because in addition to inverting, you also need to fine tune the model a bit.